So before I kick off this episode, I've got to tell everybody, and if you're watching on video, you will see this. If not, you've got to trust me. My kids just got me a Better Leadership Team Show mug. So I feel like a late night host. So I'm excited about that, but I'm even more excited. Now I'm going to tell my kids I'm more excited about the mug, but you guys know I'm even more excited about my guest on this episode. Dwayne Farley has been building small and mid-sized businesses for over 30 years. He recently sold his telecom company and now leads private peer advisory groups for CEOs and business owners. These groups help leaders step out of their daily grind to think differently, gain insights, take bold actions, and generate spectacular results. His role is to select members, coach, mentor, and provide a rigorous forum for chief executives to accelerate their growth and their effectiveness. I first met Dwayne back in October of 21 was when I did my first workshop with one of your Vistage groups. We met before that in preparation for that workshop. But I want to start off, I really want to thank you that Vistage Universe is one that has been very beneficial for me and I really enjoy spending time with. And that's because you introduced me to your group back in October of 21. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much, Mike. Truly enjoy being here. I wanted to tell you that I heard your name through one of my members and uh, who you've done some work with. And he said, we were actually at one of our one-to-ones. One of the things I do each month with my CEOs, it's coaching sessions. But he said, man, you really need to take a read this book. And it's called Breakthrough Leadership Teams. It's by this guy, Mike Goldman. I read his book. I've worked with him. You got to get to know him. I said, wow, okay, that's a great recommendation. And I read the book and then I was so impressed. I actually went back and I got it on audible.com and I heard it again as I was driving my kids down to even more to call Corpus Christi for something. So I heard well, it. Your kids must have loved that. I had some ear, earbuds on. Of course, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of conversation going on. They were doing their earbud thing. I was doing mine. But yeah, to all the listeners, I just huge plug for Mike's book. It is, and I've had a number of my members read it and they love it. It's good stuff. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks so much for coming on the show. So let's start with you. In the intro, I said you lead these peer advisory groups. Let's start real basic. What is a peer advisory group? Fundamentally, it's bringing a bunch of really smart, ambitious business leaders to include all their businesses or they've ascended to the CEO seats or president or we've got PO responsibility for their companies, and we bring them together each month to brainstorm, look at issues or opportunities that they have in their businesses. This is very much a roll up your sleeves, get together and use the collective wisdom of the group. Now, everybody is from a different industry who are sitting around the table. It's typically a very small group. My groups range from, we range about 15 or 16. So we come together each month. And we're talking about the things that are most important to those CEOs. And it's an opportunity for them to work on the business, but in the business. It just makes a huge, just makes a huge difference. What do they get out of that? Now, you said you do some one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. So put that aside for a second, but from those group sessions, and I'll get, we'll get into detail on what those look like and the discussions there, but what do your clients get out of those group sessions that they couldn't get out of meeting with their leadership team or their own board of advisors, or what is it that's different? And there's a couple of aspects to that question. And by the way, I spent, as you mentioned, I spent 22 years in the CEO seat of several different companies. One of the things you learn really quickly is that it is, in fact, lonely at the top. It, but what does that mean? What it means is, look, there's some things that you don't tell your board. Not to try to hide anything, but there's a certain level of thinking and things that are going on that they don't need to know about. They've got their own fish to fry. There are things that you don't talk about to your executive team for a lot of different reasons. And so 
really what this time together as a group is about is executive thinking time. Carving out a day a month to do nothing but work with other executives and have that time to think. Now, and some people will say, well, I can do that. I can do that all the way to uh, work or as I'm traveling to see a client. Absolutely. You're right. It, it, you're always thinking about, there's always some, there's always real, there's always this real on the back of your head, you know, when you're thinking about business, even when you're at home, you're thinking about the business. The difference here is that all those things that you're thinking about, those really critical decisions or those opportunities that you're not sure you should take advantage of, here's a place that you can take and you can put it on the table and say, hey guys, I need some help thinking through this. What are the pros? What are the cons? Should I do this? Should I not do this? If I'm going to do it, how am I going to do it? How am I going to explain it? You know, how am I going to message this? How am I going to present it to my board? How am I going to present it to my, all of those things you can now take and have conversation with other executives who are probably thinking through similar things themselves. It can get some valuable feedback. I find it so critical because as you said, some things you may not want to tell your board may not be the right discussion to have with your board yet. But I also think just as importantly, and maybe this comes up more often, there are things you absolutely should not be discussing with your team yet. There may be issues with your team that you need some outside advice on, coaching on, experiences that that you're just not going to get anywhere else unless you've got some group of trusted folks that have been where you are that you can share that stuff with. And to your point, it's all about, look, so much of what we're thinking about, this executive thinking time, but stuff that we're working through is half-baked. All right? Do you really want to take half-baked ideas or opportunities to your team or to your board? Probably not. Let's put it in the oven a little bit longer and let other people take a look at it, look at the recipe. I'm overusing the metaphor here, but the point is that's what these people around the table are there to do, is to put another set of eyes on it that had with similar kinds of responsibilities and help you flesh it out, whatever that looks like. And some of the aspects of this, like I said, are vetting opportunities or talking about issues. Sometimes it's about accountability. We've talked about the group has helped you through some process, through some thinking. You said, you know what? That's a great idea. I think that's something I need to do. That's some conversation I need to have, you know, that's, and so now the group comes back around and says, okay, did you do it? What was the result? Was it a positive or a negative? What would you have done differently? And so some pieces of it sometimes are accountability. And CEOs, I needed it. I needed it today. And it's getting a bunch, again, of really smart people and putting them together and give them, giving them a construct. And that's my job as a facilitator. My job as a former CEO, as a, the chair of this group, is to make sure that we stay on track, that we get good work done. Now, we have a lot of fun. We do it. We laugh. But in the end, it's about how do we take and build our businesses and scale them to that next level, whatever it looks like. And just so you know how important I believe this is, I'm actually a member of three of these types of groups. And we'll talk about the specific, we'll talk a little bit more about Vistage and what that group looks like. For mine, they were more, more informally organized and we do some formal stuff, but it's, so I've got a group of other coaches that I talk to once a month and it's a couple hours on Zoom. We help each other with our good ideas, our bad ideas, client problems. Then I've got another group of speakers I do the same thing with. And I just had this morning a group of me and 12 different CEOs that are locally. We get together once a month and all share challenges we're having with our businesses. And let me be clear, it's not a networking group. Not that some business, not that some business might not be shared from time to time, but it's not networking. And it's important it's not networking because I think when you're networking, you're always trying to put a positive spin on your business because you're trying to sell to other people. Absolutely. Knowing it's not net networking means you can come in and say, man, I'm just not feeling really good about the business today. I'm not, I'm troubled by the level of service we're giving our clients. Wow, you're never going to say that. 
to someone you're networking with, but you would say it to your peer advisory group. And what's interesting is the people, you can do business with people they trust. Over time, that's exactly what you have in this group. You have a lot of trust. And so, yeah, you just naturally gravitate toward maybe wanting to do business with some of them if you've got a need. But to your point, this is a working group. We're there to solve challenges. We're there to scale our businesses. To pivot back to what you were saying about having multiple groups, as I'm talking to CEOs that are not, who are not familiar with the model of having a peer group, they'll say, I'm concerned about my time. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to do this. Valid concern. And they'll say, right now, I'm already part of a industry group. I'm in the refrigeration industry and I've got a hundred, I go to the conventions and I've got all these industry people that I work with. And they said, isn't that basically the same thing? And the answer to that is absolutely not. By the way, I'm all for industry groups. I was part of industry groups that all in the couple of different industries I was in. I think they're hugely beneficial. They give you a lot of exposure to best practices and that's a good thing. But in the end, if everybody from, if everybody around the table is sitting in the same industry, everybody's asking the same questions and giving the same answers. That's pretty, that's pretty simple. Best practices are a great thing. You want to take advantage of that as much as possible in your organization. But in the end, if, well, if the best you ever get are best practices, then all you're doing is what your very best competitor is doing. That's as good as you're getting. So. That's one of the things that I, that we talk about a lot is the importance of having more than one industry represented around the table is that you get lots of industry, you get lots of expertise from other people doing maybe radically different things than you are. And that's powerful. There's a lot of innovation that comes out of it. And so what's funny is as a chair, as a facilitator, I get to watch this going on. And that's hugely fulfilling for me. Love it. So tell us a little bit more, and I want to get down into what happens in these meetings, but I mentioned Vistage a few times. So for those, I imagine a lot of people are aware of Vistage. They've heard of Vistage, but maybe they don't know a lot about it. Tell us a little bit more about Vistage and maybe what makes that different than other peer advisory groups or just saying, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to start one myself. What is Vistage all about? Well, let me start that conversation this way. Uh, I've been a business chair now for going on five years. As I exited my last company and did my time with them, and then as I exited that, I was looking for my next equity investment. A recruiter calls me and asked me if I'd be interested in being a chair for Vistage. I go, first of all, I don't want, I don't know who Vistage is. I don't know what they do, but what you're telling me sounds intriguing. And they said, look, before you say no, if you would go talk to some members in DFW, that's where we are here in Dallas and in some other chairs at Metroplex, I said, okay, I can do that. That makes good sense. So anyway, about six weeks later, after I did just that, talked to some members, talked to some chairs, they called me back and said, where are you at? Do you think you'd have an interest? And I said, not only do I have an interest, sign me up because I get to literally make a lot of difference in these other small to medium-sized businesses. So what is Vistage? Vistage has been around for about 65 years. I had no idea until I saw what happens here. A guy by the name of Bob Morse up in the Northwest, he was a successful businessman. He and a bunch of his peers got together and it was effective. It was hugely impactful to their businesses. And they said, why isn't there? So why wasn't there some mechanism to do this? across the United States or worldwide, why not? And so they created this a small outlet and that's where Vistage came from. So for 65 years, they've been starting groups all over the country and all over the world. So right now there's some 40,000, 45,000 members worldwide. 8% of those are here in the U.S. Here in DFW, there's some thousand plus CEOs and senior execs that are in multiple groups. And again, we come together once a month to work all the business as opposed to in the business. What does a typical business day look like? Several times a year, I'll bring in speakers um, on a wide range of topics. So one of the things that I like to do as a chair, part of the model is that I meet with the members once a month as a coach, typically an hour to an hour and a half. And that's aside from the time we spend together as a group. 
one of the things that comes out of those discussions are what are the concerns? What are the issues that my members are facing? What do they need to hear? Both new information as well as things that need to be reinforced. And so I'll schedule speakers multiple times a year to come in for typically two to three hour workshops. They're typically experts in their industry and they package this up in such a way that it's CEO, it's senior executive kind of information. This guy by the name of Mike Goldman at one point came in and did one, did a workshop for us. I, like, I hear amazing things. That's an amazing, yeah, you're right. It's an amazing <laughs> thing, right? But you are a great example. What is it that Vistage members need to hear? And that is how do you take and create or enhance or add to their leadership team? How do you make them the most effective team possible? And so that's why I would bring in someone like a Mike Nolan to talk to them and get them points and how are you going to take and evaluate your employees? And so very often as a CEO, there's a certain body of information that you and expertise that you bring to that seat. And so sometimes the things that we should know as CEOs, but maybe we've forgotten. Maybe we need to see it and hear it in a little bit different packaging to spur our thinking. Sometimes it's new information. Like for example, a couple of months ago, we had a speaker on AI. And not the lofty hyped AI that you hear in the press, but more along the lines of, look, there are some AI products out there, and these are the kinds of things that they do, and this is kind of back office efficiencies and effectiveness that it can bring, something that for you to check into, put your IT people on and start thinking about it, because at some point, if you're not doing it, your competition is. And so existing information, new information, we bring speakers in to spur some thinking, but at every meeting. Typically the back half of those meetings are we close the doors, it's members only, and we start drilling down. We start talking about our companies and what are our challenges and our opportunities and how are we going to take advantage of them? What is our thinking and what thinking can you get from the rest of the members of the group? And give us a little bit more of a sense, Dwayne, and I've seen some of that, but I think it'd be helpful to draw a picture of is that. Now we've got two hours, everybody spends five minutes on what's going on in their business, or is it, hey, we've got a chunk of time, it's Sarah's turn, and she's got three hours to talk about it. Like what, and certainly you're not going to share anything that from any of your members, but if you can give us a sense of the types of issues and the types of conversations that spawn from that. And again, that's where these one-to-ones that I have with the members each month come into play. Because we'll be having a coaching session. We'll be discussing some things. Maybe it's some issue of non-performance or with one of their senior execs, with their CFO or CEO, whatever. And I'll say in the one one, I think you can use my insight from the group on this. How about bringing this to them? And today it's like, yeah, I'll take a great idea. And so we'll flesh that out a little bit. And so as we get into the, what we call executive session portion of the monthly meeting, I'll say, look, John Hannah is a, John has an issue and Mark has an issue uh, that we want to take a process through. One of the things that is unique about Vistage is that they've got a process, they call it issue processing, but it's a methodology for working through a complex issue. You know, how do you ask really good questions? And let's not embed answers. Let's fully understand what the issue is. Are we working the right issue? And then, and so it's a really effective methodology they've been using for years and years. And we'll take these issues or these opportunities or these brainstorming sessions, we'll put them through that funnel, through that process. And at the end of it, it's okay. What did you hear? What can you use here that you're going to take back to your company and give us a time frame? And so it gives us as a group something to get to hold them accountable to. Okay. So that gives us a sense of what happens in the meetings, in between meetings, other than yes, you do your one-on-ones. Do you find that the members of the group are building relationships where they are supporting each other in some ways between those meetings? Yep. You'll find them going out to lunches or going out to drinks, both sometimes after the meetings, certainly they get to know each other. This is 
it's relationships, it's relationship building at its best. The other people around the table, you want to get to know them. You want to get to know their industry because it's interesting and trying to figure out how you can take, take and leverage that in your industry, what you're doing and how you're building your company. And it's interesting to what, you know, it was by design, but it wasn't. You'll have a couple of different dynamics going on in the group. You'll have the owner founders, people who have started their baby bootstrap their company. And you'll have those types of leaders represented in the group. Then you'll also have those that are what I would call professional managers. Those would be maybe people who were brought in by private equity or for whatever reason, their job was to come in and as a CEO and either turn the company around or take it over from the owner founder and take it to the next level. But again, different views, you'll find the owner founders tend to be very, okay, let's stop talking about, it. let's jump in, let's get it done. Uh, you'll have the professional manager sometimes will spend a lot of time on the analytical side and all the pros and cons and putting those two dynamics together in one room is fun and it's effective because whichever side of the table you tend to work on tend to be most, be most comfortable with, you always get the other side and you get lots of perspectives. And so I think to watch that process is really interesting and the members took a lot from it. Yeah, and it's gotta be rewarding for you. I imagine there are times that you really have to work to facilitate the group and other times the group just starts helping each other and you can just sit back and smile and say, look what I've created here. Most of the time, if I'll just keep my mouth shut, everybody will take in. It, it's like a snowball. It takes off. Especially when you get to a certain place in your organization, we are the senior leaders in our organization, right? There's some things that if we don't do them well, they just don't happen. And I tend to have the conversation that it's vision, it's culture, it's accountability. We, as the senior leaders in our companies, if we don't do those three things well, honestly, they probably don't get done at all. Certainly not well. And as these senior leaders start to recognize that, you'd be surprised how the conversations almost automatically gravitate for those things in helping people flesh those out and be more effective at it and starting holding people more accountable in their organizations. So. What, what I love about that is very often what I see in CEOs is that, especially when they're a little newer on the job as CEO, they're an entrepreneur that's built something or they were a hired CEO is, and they'd never admit to this, but most CEOs think their job is to do everybody else's job. Absolutely. Which is dangerous on so many levels. I, we could do a whole other podcast on that. And actually did have an early episode. Someone come in and talked about the job of a CEO, Brad Giles, who is great. But what I love about Vistage is because you make sure those conversations are those strategic conversations, you're almost, you know, forcing people, peer pressuring people, you, they've got to get out of doing everybody else's job to have those kinds of conversations. Because I don't think the other seasoned CEOs would stand for a conversation down in the tactics of doing somebody else's job. It challenges you to be more than that. It, that is absolutely true. And you'll see those conversations all the time. And you'll hear them asking each other, what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? Is that really a good use of your time? I heard that up heard it a hundred times and you love it because again, it comes back to the executive thinking time. What are you thinking about? Is it really worth your time to be thinking about that? And what are you going to get off of your plate onto somebody else who should be doing that? And that's going to free up some thinking time. And what really is important for you to spend those cycles on? And so again, it comes back to how do you know, Vincent has their tagline is better leaders, better decisions, better results. And as you watch this process go on with these CEOs, it is absolutely true. I couldn't think of a better tagline than that. And it is about making better decisions, but forcing those decisions. They're not just your decisions. It's 
forcing those decisions down to the organization, being confident that people are going to make those decisions, giving them the authority to do that, and then seeing that manifest itself in positive results. So yeah, it's about us being better leaders, but it's about allowing others to be good leaders as well. And showing yeah. them how to and in talking about that and getting it down, cascading it down through the organization, Vistage does something very interesting in that we've been talking about CEO peer advisory, but Vistage does something interesting and in, is that there's a key executive group yes. as well. Talk a little bit about what that means and, and why that's important. Well, so right now I've got two CEO groups, I've got a key group. So I've got CEOs and those two groups that filter down, that typically take and put their most senior executives, a senior executive in that group, in the key group as well. And so what's interesting about that is that gives them these COOs, CFOs, senior executives, an opportunity to have the same experience, to get out of the day-to-day, -day, get out of the weeds of the business and spend a day a month and talk about to work on the business instead of in the business. Think about things a little bit more strategically. And it also gives me an opportunity to take in reality check what I hear from the CEOs that they would ever embellish. But again, everything that happens is happening from their perspective. But it's interesting to hear from their senior executives, maybe some areas that they need to improve or some issues in the company that maybe need a different perspective. And so having all these senior executives working together in their own group is hugely impactful. If my key group was full because had these CEOs realize how important it is. And so they can't wait to get some of their senior executives in this. Yeah. And it's a different issue, but it's so CEOs, as you said at, at the top of the show, CEOs, it's a lonely job. People complain up to you, you can't complain down. That doesn't work very well. So it's a lonely job. It's great to be around other CEOs for all the reasons we've talked about. As a COO or a CFO or that next level, I, I think it may be less lonely because yet you, could, you can complain up and you can complain sideways, so it's less lonely. But I also think there's less of a chance for CEOs to learn from, build relationships with other CFOs, COOs and other COOs. That's a rare thing. And it is super, super powerful because very often someone was elevated to that CFO or COO position. And unless they can open their eyes to what's going on in other organizations, they may not really have a sense of how to do that job and what the focus of that job ought to be anything over and above what the CEO is telling them to do. So getting that exposure is incredibly beneficial. Yeah, and there's two pieces that I think that you hit on it. And one is, look, especially when you start talking about the C-suite, you put C in front of anybody's title, chief financial officer, chief operating officer, chief something, that C automatically means you need to be looking three to five years out, it's at least three years in terms of what does the organization need to look like? And so we spend a lot of time talking about that. If, with your CFO or CHRO or COO, what does that look like? If you have to think out three years, what needs to change from what it is today? But the other piece of that is that you've got CFOs sitting at the table, COOs, again, from different companies, different disciplines within the organization represented. Now you can start talking about how do we take and you know, we, we spend, actually spent a lot of time on this. How do we take and make only our piece of the organization more effective, but how do we take and work more effectively with other parts of the organization? How do we take the personalities out of it and make that more effective? and then introduce the personalities back on to, into it and then try to figure out how to work that out. And so it's breaking down those silos, how the various parts of the organization will work together more effectively. Yeah, and by breaking down the silos and by helping the CFOs and COOs and VPs, helping them think more strategically, you're helping the CEO be able to step back and spend more time 
working on the business than in the business and think more strategically. So it's beautiful. And I will say part of the power of it is the Vistage groups, at least that I've been exposed to, and I've done between CEO groups and key executive groups over the last year and a half or so, it's probably 13 or 14 of them. And I've got thankfully more scheduled, but the power of it is not just that there's a bunch of CEOs in the room or key executives in the room. They're there because they want to be there. They're there because they believe it's worth their investment of time. They're there because they want to grow themselves and grow their business. So you're not just there with a bunch of other leaders. That's great. But you're there with a bunch of other leaders that are really trying to grow their businesses and themselves. So it just becomes a beautiful environment for growth and sharing and challenging each other. What I think is interesting, and any business chair will tell you this, is that there's a whole different energy with the key group than there is with the CEO group. You know, we as CEOs will tend to say to show up and, you know, we're kind of stoic and just have a CEO persona on our face. Key groups are totally different. They show up in sponges. They're so happy to be there. They just want to absorb the information and to work together. It's, it's a whole different level of energy. I truly enjoy them. I love my CEO groups. They're fun, but the key groups have an extra special place in my heart. How would you recommend for someone listening to this who is saying, I'm not part of one of these groups, but man, that sounds good. Vistage or otherwise, I've got to find a group to be a part of. What should folks be thinking about when looking at different groups? How do, is it about find a group that's got a great chair? Is it about, you got to go visit, make sure you're, you could be best friends with everybody around the table. What should people be thinking about as they evaluate this? And to your point, I would absolutely, whether it's Vistage or some other kind of peer group, and I get, there's others out there tend to be more regional than this is nationwide. But what I would tell you is you don't want to be best friends with the other people around that table. You want everybody to feel comfortable enough to challenge you, to have those important and sometimes difficult conversations in the spirit of respect, obviously, but maybe you want people who are going to take and push you to be better every month, year after year, or just as a side note. Average tenure for a Vistage member is seven years. What's important about that is think about it, that's monthly meetings, coaching meetings every month for seven years. That's the average. And so there's a lot going on there to, turn, to take and create value. The chair is a facilitator. Yeah, you want to have a chair that's experienced, but in the end, you want to find a group of very diverse individuals, different industries, and that are willing to take and push you. That's what you're looking for. And is that within the Vistage world specifically, because obviously there are a lot of other groups and people could decide to just create something themselves, which is something I've done. But within the Vistage world, do people have the ability to visit multiple groups before they make a choice? How does that work? Typically, I'll reach out as I'm trying to fill a group and if I perceive that for whatever reason, your scheduling doesn't work out, or I don't feel like the dynamics, that's, that's part of one of the things that I do as a chair, because I know some of the other groups, for example, here at DFW, and I know some of the other chairs, how they think about things and even some of their members. And so one of the things that's important to me as a chair is I don't want a revolving door in the group. And so I'm really careful about who I invite to be part of our groups. And so I'm going to take and kind of several good conversations with a prospective member, somebody who's interested in being part of a group and making sure that it's a good fit. And if it's not, I'll try to help them find another group that is a good fit because it's to everybody's advantage, especially by my groups. I want to make sure that everybody feels like they're going to get good value in that just kind of a right combination of personalities. Yeah, and it's important. In fact, I just... Timing is interesting. I had a conversation within my CEO group this morning about a potential new member and the perspective we took, and I'm interested if Dwayne, you take the same perspective is there were some people around the table who knew this person and had good things to say. And we've got about 12 people around the table, but there were two people who were very concerned. 
for whatever reasons, they were concerned that this was the right fit, that this person was wanted in our group for the right reasons. And the perspective I took and the perspective the group took, and we've been, this group has been around for about 10 years now, but we've been around for a while, which is for Vistage, that's typical for groups that come together informally. It's not typical. They stick around Pretty. that long. Pretty. And our perspective was if we bring on the wrong member, that can be toxic to the group and asking someone to leave is not easy. The impact right. that has on the group is important. So we said, we decided, even though there were three or four people that said, oh, this person might be great. There were two people who were really concerned. We decided against inviting this person to join us because the perspective was we would rather be conservative and not have someone in that could be toxic, knowing that by us being conservative, there are times we may miss out on someone who could have been great for the group. We're willing to miss out on that person because we don't want to take the chance on having the wrong person. That's how important the chemistry of the group is. That's how important having the right folks in the group. Is that a similar perspective that you take? Absolutely. And, and the other piece of this is, I don't know that I could count the number of people that I've had conversations with, CEOs that I've had conversations with, that because I knew the dynamics of my group and I knew their needs and their personalities and just it wasn't going to be a good fit for whatever reason it wasn't going to be a good fit and so there's been a number of opportunities that i could have had someone come in and i said no this is for whatever reason this is just, it's not going to work and on a couple of occasions i found other groups here in dfw to put them in and again it's not about good or bad people it's just you want to have the optimal and that's part of my job it's part of my training through vistage is to try to figure out how do we take and create the most effective working group? That, and that's the key here. I mean, that working group, we are a working group. How do we create that most effective work? And it's a skill that you develop over time that you know who's going to be a good fit and who's not. And it's always better to take and say, you know what, for whatever reason, this isn't going to work, as opposed to just letting it happen. And then you're going to have even a more difficult conversation later. Absolutely. And if I'd say, if you are interested in finding a group, and I'm going to ask you, Dwayne, in a minute about how people can find out more about Vistage and those groups and what people should do if they're interested. But if you're looking for a group, Vistage or otherwise, my coaching is it is critical to find a group of people who are going to challenge you. They're yes. going to challenge your way of thinking. And I've been parts of these informal groups where it starts out that way, but then in a group of eight or 10, two of us grow a lot quicker than the other eight. And then all of a sudden we're adding a lot of value, but we're not getting value back. And part of the value of the Vistage is you've got Dwayne, somebody like you that manage that moving forward and make sure everybody's getting value. But just, you've got to find that room where you're going to be challenged and that you feel comfortable challenging others, where you feel like you could, that you're going to get, but you're also going to give. So Dwayne, if people want to find out more about Vistage, and if they are in the DFW area and they want to find out more about your group in particular, where do people go? What should people do if they want to find out more and check it out? Best place to go is Vistage.com. It has a portal there that you can take. Ask for more information. And this has a really good team. I've worked with them and they'll call you up. They'll have a conversation with me. Again, it's about fit and value, both for you and for the group. Okay. Yes. One of the things that's important to me as a chair and to Vistage as well, is that you get, you get an ROI from the tie or the money because it's going to cost you time to be in the group. And we're real clear with our, with our prospective members. Look, we want you showing up the meetings. We want you to be there fully present and because we've got important work to do. And it's going to cost you to be there. There's a membership fee. And you want to make sure that for the time you spend at the group, you're getting an ROI, a return on that investment. And so about every six months, I'll have a conversation with my group members. Let's, let's talk about what's gotten accomplished. How has this group at Vistage made a difference to your company? Just to make sure. We want to make sure we're on the right path here. 
And so, yes, first thing I would do is I'd reach out to Vistage. If you're in DFW, I would certainly love for you to give me a call, send me an email, we'll chat. But regardless of it's Vistage or some other group that's regional or whatever, if you're a senior leader, you need to be in some kind of a peer group, no matter who, whatever, no matter whose name is on it, but be around a group to your point, who's going to challenge you, who's going to inspire you, who's going to push you to that, whatever that next level is, you want some people behind you and it makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. And if you're thinking, I don't have enough time, I will tell you that's exactly why you need to do it. Well, right? if you don't have enough time to be spending time with people that are going to challenge you, working on your business, thinking, if you don't have the time for that, there's something wrong that you need that to fix that, that these folks could help you with. And what I tell people is, I hear that one, looks, it is the fee that keeps people from joining a group. It's that, oh my gosh, I, how am I going to take a day out of the month? I don't see Okay. You, yeah. If you can't take a day out of the month to think more strategically about the business, you have some issues, but try this on for size. Let's say that over the next six months, if you made an investment of that time with that group each month, and what if in six months you found that not only did you get that day back, but you got that day plus, because now you are in fact being that you are making better decisions, you are getting better results, you are pushing those things off of your desk onto the desk where it should be. What if that actually bought you that time plus? And that's what we see. You ask any Vistage member, that's what they see, is that the investment of time that they made, they've gotten back plus. And the average seven-year tenure, I think you said, that's proof right there. I don't know a lot that's of CEOs really that stick with seven years of anything like that. So as Dwayne said, if you are a senior leader, CEO, CFO, SVP, if you're a senior leader and you're not doing something like this, you need to prioritize it. You need to find the right group, whether it's Vistage or another group, or you got a bunch of folks and you create a group, the value is incredible. Dwayne, I appreciate you helping get this word out about peer advisory groups, mastermind groups, whatever you want to call it. This is great. And Dwayne, thanks so much for being on the show. Mike, I love it. I appreciate you having me. Take care, everybody. All right. Thank you.